Welcome to the show, everybody. Oh, I'm, I need to move over some. <laughs> there we go. Um, today's show is going to be a little tough for some of you. Um, the main thing I want to do is to put up this trigger warning, okay, because we're going to be talking about some active criminal cases and some really horrific violence that's been taking place in the United States against black women and girls. Some of you have experienced these things personally. So it's going to be, you know, the kind of thing you have to be in a space where you can listen to the discussion that we're about to have dispassionately and with an ear to what you can do to protect not only yourself, but your daughters, you know, your nieces, your granddaughters, your little sisters, that kind of thing. Um, the more research I did on this show, the more frightening it is. And um, I don't understand why I'm hoping the guests we have today can, you know, since they study this, uh, can be more insightful and share some information with you about it. Before we get started and before I introduce them, I want to go over some um, some slides and information that I put together, okay? And uh, I'm going to put, let me put this on full screen so you can see it. Um, I want you to go over these numbers with you so you get an idea of what we're going to be talking about today. This headline tells it all. At least four black women were murdered every single day in the United States in, in the year 2020. Our guest today has a website that tracks the murders of black women. And as of September 29th, her website reported that there were over a thousand black women murdered thus far in 2021. And those are the ones that they know of. Now, this is not key. This is not uh, the ones where the woman hasn't been found yet. So they don't really know what she is. They can't chalk that up to murder yet. There's more than 100,000 of those that go missing every year. Okay. Black women are shockingly killed at a rate four times as high as white women in this country. Not that any woman should be getting killed, but you see, you see the, the difference there. A study done by the FBI found that 9 out of 10 black women were killed, murdered rather, are killed by someone that they know, someone that they trust, a, you know, a lover, a relative, a family friend, a neighbor, a fellow student. The latest violence, violence policy center report says the victims who knew their offender, 63% were wives or other intimate partners of their killers. So people got on my case when I made a meme a, a couple of years ago. I said the most dangerous place where a black woman is in a relationship with a black man. Well, what do you think? Black women are killed by men they do not know as well, most often when they reject black men's sexual advances or marriage proposals. That came from an article that was published in Essence last year. Black women experience intimate partner violence at a rate 35% higher than that of white women and two and a half times the rate of women of other races that came from the Bureau of Justice Statistics. Approximately one in three black women are abused by a husband or partner in the course of a lifetime. One in three. Those are the ones that they know about because you know most of y'all don't want to say nothing. Look at the high percentage. Almost 20% of the black women who were murdered were pregnant or had just had a child. African Americans as a whole, and this isn't just women, have the highest rate of violent victimization of any racial group in this country. Then we go to our college age students, the undergrads at historically black colleges and universities. 14.2% report experiencing completed or attempted sexual assault. 90% of those knew the assailant. In another study, 53.7% reported assault and 44.8% reported experiencing sexual co coercion 
at some point in their lives. Now, let me explain what that means. That means like if you say you a guy drives you somewhere and you're in the middle of nowhere and it's the middle, you know, it's late at night. And he says, well, you put out or I'm not taking you back. That's coercion because you're looking at mountain lions, rattlesnakes and all kind of stuff that might bears. And you think, hmm, this <laughs> which one, A or B? And so you choose door B, but only because you're pressured into it. That's coercion. Of the respondents who experienced rape and coercion, 73.4%, that's almost three quarters, stated that their first sexual victimization happened before they were even 18 years old. That means they were minor children. And this is the last one. Two-thirds of all of the uh, uh, sexual assaults reported to police were, were people under the age of 18. In nearly 95% of the cases, the offender was a family member or acquaintance. So I tell you, I watched your kids. Don't be trusting people just because you think that they're your friend. Black women are less likely to involve police in cases of child sexual abuse, concerns over betraying the family, turning abusers into the system, and distrust of authorities equals silence about family business. And what happens in this house stays in this house. That is a, a very, very common uh, position. Okay. So let me get my guest. I don't know what happened to the other the other um, gentleman, but this lady that I'm about to bring on has been, you know, I didn't even know that she's the one who was running the site. I've known her for like, I don't know, 12, 15 years. It's, it's crazy. But, um, you know, this online, it's like an online buddy. I've never met her in person. But she is like one of the smartest, most together sisters. And then when I found out that she's the one running the site, I said, oh, well, of course, no wonder. Let me get her on here. What's up? Oh, let me put my, uh, I guess it would be helpful if I could hear you, huh? <laughs> What's up, Rosa? Hey, Deb. I'm so glad <laughs> to be here. I'm happier than you are. I bet you that. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I had saw it. With, uh, you had, I was on YouTube, actually, right? And you're, uh, promo came up and I was like, wait a minute. I wonder, did she try to contact me? Let me hurry up and try to uh, inbox her to let her know, hey, I'm coming. I'll come on your show. I'm available. I'll put everything down to be on your show. <laughs> that's that's my kind of friend. Oh, so you get shouts out in the chat room. And everybody's like, hey, girl. <laughs> yeah, I see you. <laughs> okay, so let's get started. First of all, <laughs> Tell them a little bit about yourself and how you decided to start this website. I was just fascinated by that. Okay. I actually have been doing this work since about 2015. The last three years, I've really uh, focused in on the work. I've really like really been laser focused. The reason that I started doing the work was because I saw that the FBI's last data was actually in 2015. They were saying every 19 hours across the board, a woman or girl in the United States was being murdered. And that would include white women, Asian women, Hispanic, you name it. That was all inclusive. I thought mm, that can't be right because black women and girls are being killed at a very high rate in the black community. So that's why I started just focusing in on the black community. So as I started collecting the data, the very first year I noticed in the black community, it was every eight hours, as opposed to the every 19 hours that the FBI was putting out. So I was thinking, you know, I'm, I'm just one person. I'm doing this by myself. I'm like, okay, you know, I'm gonna keep on, keep on trucking, keep on pushing you know, just get my numbers. I, I had to like, just be like a, like a horse with blinders on. I had to just keep focused, even though I knew my numbers were different from the FBI's. So fast forward to 2020 last year, near about October, I want to say, about a year I ago. Know, pardon me. So about a year ago. Yeah. I noticed that 
it was every six hours. I was like, okay, you know, even right now, it gives me chills to think about it. I was like, it, we're being killed in the black community every six hours. So I started putting the hashtag out, out there every six hours, every six hours, you know, my digital footprint, it's out there. It'll, it'll show you it's every six hours. So when that messaging started getting put out there, um, I started getting a lot of pushback from male identified black women, as well as black men. They were telling me that this is propaganda, that I'm trying to tear down the image of the black man. I'm a bed wench, what, you know, agent, what have you, you name it. They called me that, but I kept on pushing, kept on pushing. And, uh, so fast forward to this year, September 25th, I actually had a march in Atlanta for black women and girls for black, uh, black femicide. And there are uh, two other young women that work alongside me. So we went ahead, had the march September 25th. On September 28th, three days after the march was completed, the FBI came out with their independent data and stated a black woman is being killed every six hours in the United States in 2020. That's what the FBI said. I felt so vindicated because I was like, oh, oh my God, my numbers and research were actually accurate. I was right on the money. Now, mind you, I'm one person. The FBI has millions of dollars. They have a team of people. And I'm thinking, man, I was right. Now, the FBI reported that 1,440 black women and girls have been murdered in 2020. My numbers I had collected was 1,169, which I still think was hell of a good because I was only 271 behind the FBI. And I still will say this. I still don't believe that the FBI's numbers are still even accurate because um, all lo localities are not they they do not have to report to the fbi right. and so you know the numbers are still greater than what even the fbi or even myself are reporting and i'm so glad you said these are just the cases that we know of you cannot include people who are missing and not found as of yet right. so these are actually just the cases that are actually known publicly yeah i tried to get the young lady that runs the you know Black girls missing sight, but um, she declined uh, to be on a live stream because she cited, you know, mental health reasons. And I guess this is a tough topic to talk about. Uh, you know, yes. she does a site, and you know, to talk about. You're a lot more. And I uh, actually, uh, yeah, I, 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 I really like her site. We kind of uh, piggyback with one another. You know, we share each other's stories and uh, what she puts out there and what I put out there. And um, also, I'd like to say this. Nobody in the United States has interviewed me thus far, except for people like you, cognizant black women. Um, I have had interviews with like the Washington Post, NBC San Diego, and they all will scrap the interview at the end. And their reasoning is because it's a very hot button topic and it is very polarizing because of who the perpetrators are. And right now, the focus is in the black community and prop and for liberals and whatnot is the fact of law enforcement involved killings. The Guardian, which is in the UK, actually did an interview with me, published my name and everything. They were the only uh, news organization to actually uh, publish my work. I read that story, but like I said, I didn't even know that was you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's, it's like, oh my God! Look at her. I need an autograph. Well, let's get uh, let's get Doctor uh, Williams here. He's he's here now, and okay. uh, allow him to introduce himself and talk about the work that he does with domestic violence in the black community. Hey there, Doctor Williams. How are you? I'm fine. It's so good to see you. Good to see you too. Uh, that's Rosa there of the website Black Femicide. Hi, Mr. Williams. Hi, Rosa. So please give the listeners a little information about you. I put your profile 
you know, a little bio about you in the show page. But, you know, sometimes people just wander in. They don't even know where they are. So yeah. if you could just say a little bit about the, your background. Well, I've been uh, working in the field of domestic violence for a long time, uh, since the late, late 70s, early 80s. And uh, I'm a professor at the University of Minnesota in the School of Social Work. And I've been there for about 30 years, and uh, I've uh, run batters intervention programs and uh, worked in battered women's shelters and uh, been on a lot of national committees. I was once on the, in the Bush administration, I was on the National Advisory Committee on Domestic Violence and worked with the CDC and Department of Education and Office on Violence Against Women and Health and Human Services. I was one of the first there, there are different institutes, culturally specific institutes, and uh, I was one of the first ones. Myself and a group of my colleagues were uh, one of the first ones that focused on African Americans. And uh, in uh, 1994, we got funded for it, and that's when the uh, Violence Against Women's Act got uh, funded. So, um, so I've done the work for a long time, either research or uh, to practice uh, uh, and doing the work. So I've been around for a little bit. Okay, so I'd like to get your thoughts on this. Because uh-huh. um, some people, I was you know, listening on some other media platforms and they feel like uh, the violence towards black women changed in the late 70s due to feminism. That black men felt disempowered because women have so much more freedom and and uh, mm, autonomy, shall we just say, independence of a, of a man in a relationship, and they don't like that. That's what this guy was saying. So you, since you've been doing this for decades, I wanted to get your thoughts on have you noticed an increase in violence in sheer numbers and the type of violence against black women and girls, or do you think it's just social media making us more aware of it? I think it's social media making us a bit more aware of it. The reality is that the field of uh, domestic violence was something that sort of developed in the 70s. And you had uh, uh, issues around rape crisis that happened before that. But then there was uh, some attention to intimate partner violence afterwards. It was sort of an offshoot of what was going on with rape crisis. Um, and then you didn't, de- you developed some shelter programs in the seventies, but you really didn't, uh, but you worked on developing bat- batters and adventure programs in, in some would say in the, uh, seventies, but it was really in the eighties and you had, um, uh, pro arrest policies that existed in the, in the eighties, uh, due to a study that they did in Duluth, Minnesota. Uh, that showed that if you ended up uh, confronting men who batter around their violent behavior, then it, you were less likely to have them repeat that behavior. Then it took off across the United States. Now, the thing of it is, they haven't been able to replicate that study uh, in the uh, uh, in the since uh, that time, even though I think some people tried to do it. But they haven't been able to replicate the study to show that it's a, a real diversion uh, of most men's behaviors. Some, I believe some men can change and some men may not continue to be abusive, but it's no guarantee and you don't know which men will and which men won't. You know, they, you know it's interesting with women who use force is what Lisa Lawrence, uh, who writes about this, uh, what she talks about. But she's got a typology of women who have been uh, who use force, and the proportions are much higher with men that are uh, uh, use violence than the women who use force. But you don't have a satisfying typology for men who use uh, violence against women. But the the thing that I, I found is that when we try to have conversations about violence uh, towards uh, men, you know. Uh, or violent, or women who use violence, uh, in or women who uh, end up receiving violence, 
there's less attention given to uh, violence that occurs to women than there is violence that occurs to men. So yeah, we have, that. yeah, both things are important, but you have to, uh, we have to figure out how to walk and chew gum at the same time. As a well, I think, you know, with what Rose is doing and what the other websites are doing, the sheer volume of numbers of men who, I mean, the guys might get hit a little time by a woman or occasionally that show, what was it called? Snapped, I think. You know, the woman gets fed up with him and she offs him. But in general, I think the violence that women suffer at the hands of men is like 50 to 1. It's, um, and then women, you know, get uh, permanently maimed and murdered and, and turn up missing. It's just really awful. Yeah. I'm going to play a, I'm gonna play a clip for you. Let me put my trigger warning back across the screen because this, this is what's been, this is actually kind of in the social media domain. This is a rapper. Uh, let me find it, find that clip. Uh, 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 where did I put it? Oh, here it is. Okay, here we go. Let me uh, mute your mics so that uh, we can play this. All right. Nigga, these bitches ain't fuck I said, nigga. I said what the fuck I said. Fuck black women, nigga. I don't give a fuck what nobody see. And I want y'all to record this shit, nigga. I mean that shit. Fuck black women, nigga. Fuck black women. I mean that shit, nigga. Fuck all types of black women, too. I don't give a fuck they melanin. Like, they mix black and have something else. Any woman got black in her blood, not because she's black, but if she's woman, nigga, fucking beat the shit out that bitch, nigga. Okay. So, just in case you aren't sure that you heard what you think you heard, I'm going to play the clip one more time. All right. Nigga, these bitches ain't fuck I said, nigga. I said what the fuck I said. Fuck black women, nigga. I don't give a fuck what nobody see. And I want y'all to record this shit, nigga. I mean that shit. Fuck black women, nigga. Fuck black women. I mean that shit, nigga. Fuck all types of black women, too. I don't fuck they melanin. Like, they mix black and have something else. Any woman got black in her blood, not because she's black, but if she's a woman, nigga, fucking beat the shit out that bitch, nigga. Oops. Okay. Okay. I was speechless. One of the viewers sent me that, like, that's just a brief clip from a show that was like four or five hours long. It was insane. But uh, I just wanted that part because this is the mentality that young women are getting hit with online and offline in real life. And what's really amazing to me is that, you know, and Dr. Williams, you might have some insight into this. Why are these young men so angry? What in the world is making them have such hateful, violent attitudes towards women they don't even know, never talked to, never met, are related to, don't know, won't ever know? What is going on? Do you have any insight at all? You yeah, too, Rose. I'm uh, going to get to you in a minute. We, uh, uh, when I was with the Institute, uh, the Institute did a, a conference in 2004 about hip hop and domestic violence. And we, we videotaped it. And one of the things, there was a group back then called Hollow Point. And they did a song and we had the event in uh, uh, Queens. And uh, when we asked this rap group, they had done this song called I Hate My Baby's Mama. And uh, uh, and so when they did the uh, the song, they when the, what they brought was they brought the the full video because they wanted everybody to see it. And they were saying it had two parts to it. I hate my baby's mama, but the other part was I hate my baby's father. And that wasn't was was getting sold in the stores. What was getting sold in the stores was I hate my baby's mama. And when we interviewed the group, they said that they had a list of uh, 300 or, or more songs that they had. But when they went through it, the company that uh, 
had contracted with them, went through their songs, and pulled that one out. So the reality around it was they wrote this song uh, and they did it to be able to get people's attention. So it was really the the uh, record companies that were was pushing uh, what type of music they wanted to uh, share with uh, the audience that they thought would get people's attention. And so uh, I had a, um, a friend uh, who's now uh, Dr. Uh, Johnny Rice. He's uh, he uh, teaches out uh, in, in Baltimore. Uh, he used to do a fatherhood group, so he took the song to the fatherhood group and he uh, to try to get their opinions. And when he uh, listened, and the, the young men said, "Well, we're just trying to keep it real because there's mothers and fathers that don't like each other." And so uh, Johnny basically came back and says, there's one thing about keeping it real, but there's another thing about keeping it right. And keeping it right is what you want to do. And so we have to look at who's promoting it and pushing it. The other thing is the fact that if there's a group of young men that promote the fact that they want women to be harmed without, without thoughtfulness, uh, about it, then there's something uh, challenging and wrong with them for having that opinion. Uh, they need to be able to uh, be reflective about how they want to treat other people in the community. And and getting pushback from a lot of people who are less aware is not something, and, and including it within our community, is is not something unusual. We, we did something, there's a woman named Kelly Mitchell Clark, who used to be with the Family Violence Prevention Fund. So we did this project with them. Now they're called Futures Without Violence. And we called it the It Is Your Business campaign. And we took this radio show uh, from uh, across the country. And so they played it on different radio shows that were in the black community. And we went to a lot of people to get their uh, support of it. And uh, uh, the the thing that a lot of people had mixed feelings about was playing the the series on uh, radio. And it told a story, probably about 12 segments, where each week there would be a new segment that would come on. And they had a radio host named Ma B, who would kind of have introduced something about the issue of domestic violence. And uh, uh, and then to the to the point where a woman was being beaten, and then the last episode was basically you'd heard a lot of it, and you got family members to come together to be supportive of her. And then they uh, confronted the, the man who battered. The community did. And uh, what was interesting is that you got um, a lot of men to uh, call into the show because they thought it was real. And they uh, uh, they felt like they wanted to either tell somebody about some woman that they knew they had been victimized or that they were calling in support of it or against it. And uh, so the, the thing is that if you find a way to be able to communicate that within the community, it's an important way to be able to respond to it, to get people educated about it and how to respond to it and give attention to the issue and then to break some myths. Sometimes there's issues about if you're Christian or Islamic, you know, where you think that the Bible or the Quran gives you permission to be abusive. The reality hold is- Hold on a second, Dr. Williams. Let me uh-huh. give Rose's opinion. Okay. And we're gonna get into that because I think uh, religion is a big part of, of what's going on here. Okay, Rosa, what do you think is going on or why young black men are so angry? Have you had any opportunity to uh, talk to people on that issue? Yes. Um, you know, I, I'm a community-based nurse. I've been in uh, nursing for a little over 31 years now. Um, I grew up in the time of uh, when these lyrics really started becoming toxic in the community. So we're talking about the mid to late 80s. I was a high school student. In fact, I did a paper uh in high school uh regarding uh pmrc or the parents music resource commission 
and C. Dolores Tucker, who are both very outspoken in regards to the early stages of misogyny that were being targeted against black women and girls. At that time, we're talking about the 80s uh, during the crack, you know, height of the crack ep epidemic, when there were not many uh, males in the home. There weren't ma very many males in the home. So you have a lot of male to male peers who did not have a positive role model. So they're feeding off of the toxicity and anger that they felt against women it started to become a reflection in the music and they just were drawn to that and then you also had a faction of black women who felt well it's not me that they're talking about so you know if you know basically uh let it fly you know if it doesn't apply let it fly you know a lot of people in the black community were coming up against c dolores tucker you know i'm, I'm sure many of you uh remember the backlash she received Mm -hmm. about my father knew her. Up. He used to talk about her all the time yes she wanted to put a lid on this well the black community banded against her and they stood in favor of having this negative messaging you know i'm not a business executive i can't speak to that you know point of propaganda and how they were putting out music but i do know that our community ate it hook line and sinker now fast forward to 2021 and we're seeing all of these negative effects from not being accountable not saying that this is not who we are that this is not uh the type of propaganda that we should be putting out there and you have a faction of men like the one that you showed there are other men um i hate to mention their name like tommy sotomayor who started putting out a lot of negative messaging in fact a person who followed Tommy Sotomayor, who was putting out a lot of negative messaging regarding black women, he went on to kill a black woman in Detroit. You have a black manosphere on the internet who are actively engaged in putting out messaging towards harming black women and girls. In fact, uh, that Space Ghost person said, uh, telling all of his followers to hurt and harm women, black women and girls, who are ages 40 and younger because he feel that they're a part of the problem with women being unruly, women not listening to men, women being independent with their education and whatnot. So I probably see it um, a little bit differently. I'm not learned in the field like um, Mr. Williams is, but what I do know is that I work in the community and I, um, I have a teenage daughter and I can tell you at the high school that these teens are definitely eating this music up right. they are believing it and they are harming girls they are uh, raping girls they are doing all sorts of heinous things to black women and girls because that is the messaging that is going out there and it, it's just it's out of control now you know see dolores tucker actually foresaw what we're going through now Okay, I want to ask everybody, please do not mention those Cretans' names in the chat. We already know who they are. So, Lady Boss, if you can go and delete all of those, everybody who mentioned one of those knuckleheaded, jerk-ass people, I do not want their names anywhere in my chat stream, okay? I don't mention their names anywhere on my channel. I don't want them promoted here. Mentioning their names is a, is a way of promoting them because people who are silly are going to go and want to try to find out what they said. Stop doing that. I know a lot of you are new here and you don't know the rules, but anybody who mentions any of those clowns' names, you will get removed from the show, okay? I just want to make that very clear. Do not type their names in the chat. We don't need to know who they are. All we need to know is that they're jerks. Okay. That's what we're going to do. So, Lady Boss, if you see them doing that, just block them. Okay. Because I've, I've, I've now let everyone know. And if they continue to do it, then just please feel free to block them. Okay. I want to show you, um, in line with what we were just talking about, let me share uh, some more some more information I want to share with you. Some recent cases. 
in the news. Okay. These are recent crimes in the news. Then we'll, then we'll go back to uh, the show. All right. Uh, let me see. Hold on a second. Let me make this full screen. There we go. All right. Here we go. You guys, brace yourselves. Okay, all of these cases that I'm about to show you, and these are just a few things, you know, I got tired of putting the slide together to tell you the truth. Uh, these individuals, all these cases took place within the last 30 days, most of them within the last two weeks. Okay, this, you know, a lot of the the, the shoot, the, the women end up dead because of gun violence. They, the guys all have guns, even the ones who are felons have guns, the way they shouldn't. Um, they get into arguments or they want the woman, they want the woman to do something that she does not want to do, like stay with them when she wants to leave. She's tired of his stuff, the violence, the cussing, him not working, whatever. She wants to leave and they don't want her to go. That is the theme in several of these. Okay, so this guy killed his fiance. This guy attacks a woman who is just waiting for a bus. Okay, forced her to the point where, and damaged her body to the point where she had to be hospitalized for a week and have physical therapy to recover for eight months. What kind of violent fool is this? Okay, this goes far beyond domestic violence. So that's why, you know, Rose is here. Because, yeah, we have a lot of stuff that is, you know, couple, it takes place between couples, it takes place within uh, domiciles or you know interpersonal relationships but this is a complete stranger all right this guy this one just just happened in this October um, and this happened in full view of dozens of people not one person stepped up to help that woman instead what they did was whip out their cameras and film it the police in Philly said if they find anything online under anybody's name like that, they're going to jail. And I, I'm glad they made that stance. So this this guy, I mean, what in the world is, what's wrong with you? What is happening here? I'm really starting to wonder if there's something, like there's some kind of like mental illness going on. And if you look at the eyes of each one of these people, their eyes are dead. There's no light in them. The light that you see in his eyes is a reflection of the flash bulb, which you can tell because see how it's bright on his forehead too? That's the flash. But the eyes themselves of each one of these guys are like dark pits. There's nothing there of life and liveliness. Look at this. I mean, first of all, what, who, no. He, you know, a little girl, she's 10 years old. She didn't even have a chance to start life yet. And who knows what he did, you know, they didn't say what he did to her, where he felt like he needed to hide her body. That's what got me suspicious. This guy is upset because, you know, she didn't want to be with him anymore. So he found her at the gym and killed her. And then he fled the scene, but, you know, they did catch up with him later. And then, uh, as I recall, he killed himself. Such a coward, he didn't want to go, you know, go to prison. This little boy here killed his own mother. Again, notice the dark, soulless eyes. This guy, look at those eyes again. You see what I'm saying? He killed his girlfriend. This guy killed several women. He just went on a killing spree. Again, look at those eyes. And this is the last one because, like I said, I got tired of making them. There's just too many of them. This is the one we were talking about on our channel page of the guy. Uh, she was an attorney. You know, she kicked it with him for a little while, and then she didn't want to be bothered with him anymore. And he, he was not having it. And so he killed her when the police killed him, killed him. So that was the end of that. All right. And Deb, 
I just want to say one thing. You said uh, you had quoted the numbers from September. I yeah, can I tell that you from, right. I think that came from that Guardian article. Yes, at the time of the that was at the time of the article. But I do my uh, numbers live time with my followers. Right now we're at one thousand two hundred and forty five. The numbers are jumping extremely quickly, extremely quickly. You know, there there are times when I can have one number and by the next morning I, I've had to add an additional six women or girl, six women and girls. You know, it the numbers are jumping very, very fast. Why the black community does not want to talk about uh, black femicide uh, is, is, is beyond me. It's beyond me. And I really feel it's uh, intentional. It's intentional because of who the perpetrators are. Yes, this is a subject that is very heavy. It's very hard to swallow, but it is not fair that black women and girls should have to continually be uh, kindling on the fire of toxicity in the community. And no one wants to talk about this. Every six hours was what uh, the FBI said and what I collected. But as of now, we're closer to every five and a half hours. And we're getting right up on what women are being killed in South Africa every four hours. This is like, we're, we're getting close to third world numbers. And the black community is ignoring this issue. This is, this is a public health crisis. As a nurse, I know what a public health crisis looks, looks like. Femicide in the black community is a public health crisis. And it is alarming to me and very telling about who is being protected, who the mainstream media even said why they would not run my interviews is the reason it, it, it shows who they want to protect. You know, I, I don't know, I have no control over the media, but what I do know is that mainstream media in the United States refuses to run these stories. I do know that politicians in the black community will not address it. They will not respond to me when I try to get someone to talk about this issue. This is a public health crisis in the black community. Okay, so now let's talk about why. Why do they not want to talk about it? I think some of it has is due to uh, the religious beliefs, as Oliver pointed out. They think that they're following these holy guidelines where the man is supposed to be you know, the leader and woman does what he says and, you know, follows him, submits to him and all this kind of stuff. And a lot of guys promote that. I, You know, all over social media, you hear it. And they feel like if a woman challenges their way of thinking or their decision that she deserves, and this is quote, she deserves to be punished for that, that she's not a good wife, that she's being, uh, what's the term I forgot now? There's a term for it in the, in the, the biblical religious sect. Submissive. Well, the, the when she's not submissive, they call it something else. But anyway, um, so I wanted to get your your two you know your thoughts on that. Like as they say, uh, statistically, African American women are the most religious demographic in the United States. So if you have a lot of women who have that mindset that you know that they should be submissive to a man and do what he says and all this then how did, would that impact that woman's uh, acceptance of violent behavior, violent words, and that kind of thing? Have you done had any work done in that direction, Oliver or Rosa? Read anything? Yeah. Uh, we had a project uh, called Speaking of Faith. And if you go to Will, that's W-I-L-L, the, the digit two, change.org you'll see um uh among a, a number of things but among them you'll see something called speaking of faith and uh the things that we did do was to go to uh some churches that uh had a ministry around domestic violence mm. they included it in their ministry they uh, uh bishop mitchell in uh cleveland mississippi ended up training uh, uh, some of his members to be able to reach out to people within 
the uh, congregation who are dealing with the issue of domestic violence. Now, you, you have some people who don't know how to listen to a victim of abuse. You have some people who don't know how to talk to a man that's being abusive. In his places, what he did was he went over, uh, and they were educated about how to address domestic violence. They did that, but they also went to scripture and uh, talked about uh, scriptures that challenged uh, people's understanding about the uh, misinterpretation about what the Bible said and uh, we also did something similarly where we uh, talked to imams uh, about what the Quran said. And that uh, the Quran uh, also challenged uh, people's misinterpretations of the Quran. And uh, many Islamic folk know that you're not supposed to be abusive to your uh, partner, that you have five steps that a man is supposed to use uh, without being uh, violent and abusive to his partner. And, uh, and they're educated on that. And are the uh, uh, Islamic women who uh, also belong to the particular mosques. So you have people who are challenging those notions. A lot of Islamic women know it, but people are still you know, being harmed. Unless you go to a church that has a ministry or, or a, a a mosque that has a ministry that includes the issue of domestic violence. And there are people who've written about it. There's uh, um, there's Dr. Uh, Trisha Bent Goodley, uh, who's at Howard University, who writes about it. There's Dr. Andy Johnson, who's at Bethel University, that's in um, uh, Minnesota, uh, and a number of other people who have written about it. But the thing is that people know how to, I, I've heard great uh, sermons about challenging it. But some people know how to challenge it, but then they're still not connected to the the uh, problem of domestic violence to get women to understand how to think about it and address it. But if you go to, to uh, will2change.org, you'll, all, you'll see uh, uh, us interviewing people in different uh, faith environments. You'll see discussions with imams and Islamic women about domestic violence. You'll also be able to get a report about domestic violence in Islam and also a reader's guide for domestic violence and Christianity for uh, ministers who, you know, want to learn or want to uh, uh, think about how they should approach dealing with the issue. But That's good because so many people go to their churches to get, you know, what they call counseling even though these post most of the people don't have any kind of training in psychology or therapy, but they go there. And domestic and violence. Yeah, and so it would be good for that to happen. The problem I see with that is that the men aren't in church. The women are in church. The men who are doing all the stuff are not there to hear get these messages and, and training, so they have to go outside of the church environment to where those men are, which... I don't know. Seems like an interesting concept. And Let's see, Rosa, what you what do you have to say about about it? And that's what I was going to say. The same I was going to piggyback on what you said. A lot of the time the men who are being abusive from my perspective and what I have seen, they are not in the church. They they they're not there to, you know, have counsel, take counsel with the pastor, with their priest or what have you. They're they're just not there. I work with a woman named Julie Owens. She's a domestic violence specialist, and she also uh, has a Christianity uh, arm of what she does. And even she says going into the church, it's a very, very, it, 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 it's, a, it's a tight rope walk because there is still messaging out there. I can't really speak to Islam. I do have a uh, family who are Islamic and they do uh, attend a masjid. Uh, in Detroit, and I talked to my cousins about it, and it's kind of the same thing that uh, Julie says. You know, you still have this mindset where women should be seen and not heard, where they're told to endure for the sake of the marriage, you know, continue to pray, continue to do things, and in the meantime, they're being abused. Um, I can point to a case where there was a father who was a pastor in Detroit 
of, uh, of, of someone that I, I knew that was close to me. And I'm sure some of your viewers know about this case. You know, it's a trigger warning. Uh, her father was a pastor. Her father was a pastor. He went to the prison. He spoke to the parole board on behalf of this man's uh, character. The man was released on parole. He convinced uh, his daughter to hook up with this man and marry him. Uh, fast forward, the man ended up killing all four of the woman's children. Two of them were his children. The other two were not his. And mind you, her father knew why, why he was in prison. He was in prison for killing his other pregnant wife. And her own father, who was a pastor, went to the parole board because he felt that this man was uh, redeemable. And again, I'm going to continue to say this. He was a pastor who convinced his daughter to marry this person who has such a history. And this man ended up turning around and doing the same thing. So, you know, I have to say, what type of messaging are the men in the community giving to one another? It's one thing to tell women to seek therapy and, you know, get out of these relationships. You know, a lot of times the women, the brunt of domestic violence, and let's be real, is put on the victim because we have a lot of victim blaming in our community. Yep. We, Why did you pick him? Or, you know, you should have yeah. you should have just left. OK, that's what she was trying to do. He didn't want her to leave. And so this was the end result. You know, and we we have this issue in the community. Yes, there are people out there doing this. But I think that the messaging has gotten so far beyond anything that any of us uh, could even foresee, you know, since the pandemic started, you have women being killed over stimulus checks. You have women being killed for tax refunds. Nobody's talking about this. How do you combat these things? How are, what are we actually doing boots on the ground in the community to get to these young men and these older men before it gets to this point? You know, I'm seeing the end result of it because that is what my focus is. But I'm also seeing in the community that people like myself who are try trying to actively engage and change, we're being shut down. We're being ignored because this is not the face of what the, this is, I'm not the face that the black community wants to push because of what I'm saying. Gotcha. Well, that's the next thing, you know, with between all the work that you, that you two very powerful people are trying to do, you know, you, you're coming at it from different, angles mr smith is gone from the chat so don't worry about him anymore uh the work that you you guys are doing have you come across or do have you know some people or programs or ideas that you think would be something that we can use as a as a base a springboard to start training young men on how to handle their emotions and how to think about women. I'm feeling like a lot of them have, don't have dads. That's how my brothers learned how to treat women from watching him interact with my mother, you know, showing her tenderness. Even when they had a disagreement, you know, he, they could, ex they could see uh, negotiation skills, compromise, you know, uh, working things out without pun punching and pummeling on somebody. So they learned how to do that. They know, learned how to uh, master their emotions as a young man. Well, these boys are growing up without fathers. They don't even have halfway decent men in their lives. So does this mean that women are going to have to take the lead on this? I mean, a lot of women are raising sons by themselves. Or is this a, you know, a national program that somebody has? Some, I mean, a program that's local that some, we could expand nationally. I mean, what is it that we can do as people to start turning this around if there's anything do you, you have any ideas and i'll be asking you in the audience in a little bit okay have you come across anything i feel that what you said was true we need more black male role models in the community we do need black males to step up and to start talking to these young men who are not exposed to positive role models we need to let them know that they are not entitled to 
a black woman or a black girl that rejection is a normal part of life and life goes on, you know, because a lot of uh, the cases that I cover, it's either uh, women or girls saying no, not giving their phone number, and they're being shot, they're being strangled, they're being killed. Women who are in very bad relationships who finally get to the point where they say, I I want out of the relationship, you know, and, you know, that's one of the hardest times for a woman the most dangerous times is when she wants to re- leave the relationship. Yeah, so what we, yes, what we need to do is really start and get, getting a handle on talking to young black men um, about this, uh, you know, and even at an earlier age, maybe uh, <laughs> even elementary school, there needs to be some type of mentorship going that goes on, you know, as women, we're taught from a young age what not to do, what not to say, what not to wear. You know, at every corner, it's always what we should not be doing to keep ourselves safe. No one is really telling the boys what they should be doing not to harm us right. in the first place. So, yes, I think it goes back to single uh, households, but I'm not going to put it on all on single mothers because they have fathers. Some of these fathers just choose not to interact with their children. So we have to make sure that there's some type of mentoring program in the communities to help these young men navigate these feelings. What do you think, um, Dr. Williams? Well, uh, there's a couple places that I think do a good job. There, there's a, an organization called A Call to Men. Oh, Tony Porter, yeah. Yeah, and so, and and Ted Bunch. Uh, they're, uh, they got the contract. Oh, I know to Ted. It. Yeah. So you, are you in New York? No, I'm in, in uh, the San Francisco area. Okay. And so, uh, so the, the thing is with both of them, uh, they got the contract to work with the NFL, the NBA, uh, NHL, MB, and Major League Baseball uh, to work with them, uh, uh, the young people coming through. Uh, I did some consulting with them too, and I know that uh, Major League Baseball was trying to contract out some uh, specific people to do counseling with uh, the Major League Baseball uh, uh, people who were getting into domestic violence situations. Uh, but the, you know, there are batters programs all across the country, and uh, the when I first started out, you could uh, do batters program but they would be court referred actually when i started right. out they, that's what i've always seen they you you have to be you know an adult in the criminal justice system to get the access to those kind of things yeah initially you would go to it but people didn't know about them so much then you got court referred then they did court referrals almost to the exclusion of people coming socially mandated so uh so anyway, there's a program that focuses on uh, largely African American men in Atlanta called Men Stopping Violence, and uh, they work uh, around domestic violence uh, situations. But so there, there, there's a place called, uh, organization called Bisme, and Bisme uh, they basically deal with batters programs from across the around the world. And there's a guy named uh, David Garvin who uh, is, uh, uh, he's actually doing stuff for New Mexico for their coalition against domestic violence. But so if you, you contact David, he might be able to get people connected to Bisme. And it's basically batters intervention systems in the state of Michigan. And, uh, and Rosa, I heard that you're, you're from Detroit. Rosa? Yes, I'm actually from I'm I'm from Detroit. I still work with programs there. I'm not there now, but I am still very much in contact uh, with uh, people who run different programs up there. Yeah, you know. But um, I'm from Detroit yeah, I, too. I, oh, okay. Yeah, I graduated from Pershing. Oh, I, side. yeah. I graduated <laughs> from Lutheran East and, and Michigan oh, okay. State and Western, and then I went to University of Pittsburgh. Oh, yeah. okay. oh left out of this discussion. Yeah. <laughs> So, yes, I am familiar with Bisme. Um, you know, I, I do know. 
Yeah. So and so there there are a number of people, men who are involved trying to do some good things. I can name the, the first batteries program in the United States happened in the late seventies in Boston with a, a guy named David Adams. And there's a number of places across the United States, but there's not enough men. And the main thing that I was, you know, what I think was you know, referencing what Rosa was saying, it's great to have those programs for adults, but we need to get to the kids before they become adult batterers. So, you know, programs like these need to be in schools because a lot of the sexual assaults and harassment start there, even as like middle school. Um, the boys are already expressed, you know, ex exhibiting signs of being sexual predators and violent towards women and girls. And, uh, you know, I mean, we're talking 13, 14 years old. You know, it's not like they're tiny kids anymore. You know, they're, you're young teenagers. So, you know, they're having these kind of situations where they want girls. And, they're you know, a lot of things, I think the young boys are being, um, being overstimulated by the uh, porn industry, you know, because you can know, hit on your phone. I mean, you know, it's not even hidden like it used to be when I was growing up. And so I think of that is a lot of it. And it's, this, it's, it's really motivating young men to not only want to do things they shouldn't be doing to girls, but to stuff even in a, in a consensual situation, there's a lot of perversion going on, things that harm, you know, the women's bodies and uh, lower their self-esteem. It's just, a, this is like a tentacled problem. It's like every direction you go, there's some new drama. I want to get a couple of questions in from the the uh, audience. So if you have question, um, if you have a question for either of the guests, please type it in there and I'll put it across the screen so that they can respond to it. Or if you want to, hold on a second, let me get the, the, the thing. If you want to call in, um, you will not be visual, you would just be audio. Uh, there is the link, okay, and then you can just ask them your question uh, verbally. I wanted to address something, you know, um, I don't know if you've heard about this, Dr. Williams, but it's really big in the black woman community online, uh, this, this thing where they say, you know, divest from the black community, you know, divest from black men. I just want to say one thing to that, ladies, unless you plan to go to a new planet, there's no way in this world you can get away from every black man, okay? So we're talking about leaving the black community. You act like black men that are crooks and criminals don't have cars, bus passes, Uber, money for Ubers. They're going to find you if that's what they want to do. Now, you can mitigate your involvement, certainly, by distancing yourself and by your social circle and all that. But by, you know, hollering, divest, divest all the time, that makes you sound stupid. Let me just be blunt. OK, you're going to see them at work. You're going to see them on college campuses. You're going to see them in the grocery store. You're going to have to interact with them at some point. So what we're trying to do is solve the problem for the young men so that we, they don't grow up to be these kind of dudes. Talking about running away from them all the time as the sole solution is not at all the solution. Now, I have said that. Let me get naughty on the line. Okay, there you go. I muted your mic. What's your question? Hi, Ms. Deb. Hello, panelists. Um, based on my observations in our community, I find that men need to be the ones who hold other men accountable. Um, of course, women speak up for themselves, and that's great, but I really feel like men that respect other men should be stepping in to hold these men accountable. I want to see men stand up for women. And I think that's really lacking in our community. So my question to the panelists is, how do you think black men can hold women, ac men accountable for the way that they treat women? And then why do you think that that's lacking in our community? Good questions. Thank you. Well, as I mentioned, I think a call to men are making efforts to try to reach younger people and also uh, people in uh, athletics. You know, it's not broad enough. There, there have been efforts to try to reach out to young men uh, in, in schools, but it's not, again, it's not broad enough. And, you know, when we talk about sexual assault, uh, uh, there's an organization in D.C. that deals with... Uh, um, 
I think it's men can stop rape. I think it's that's what it's called. And uh, and so they talk about sexual assault and they, they talk about uh, uh, sexual assault against women. But it isn't as broad uh, as it needs to be to deal with a range of issues. A lot of times people specialize in different types of areas. So if you deal with sexual assault, you don't necessarily deal with intimate partner violence. If you deal with adult men, you don't necessarily deal with uh, youth uh, around it. So I think, you know, having, uh, and I think another thing too, is a lot of organizations that are men's organizations don't want to try to compete with women uh, uh, for funding. And sometimes it can be quite of a chat quite a challenge and a lot of places uh you know historically have not made the effort to try to to uh to do that and uh because i think the the uh focus has been on trying to get funds for women's organizations for their safety so so there's got to be some attention given to different areas uh, and different age groups, because some of the stuff is developmental, and there aren't laws dealing with everything. Uh, there needs yeah, to be laws more. Are definitely behind the times. And and so there needs to be attention given to different types of uh, issues. So, for example, violence against women. There's so many ways that men can be violent towards women, but the primary way that men get arrested for it is when they're physically abusive. Right. So, so we have to expand our uh, discussion. We have to be able to have conversations within our community about the, the, the issue and the challenges. And we, we've got to find some way to be able to, um, you know, deal with people on their developmental level uh, as well. So from a childhood to uh, uh, adulthood, you know, a lot of the violence that takes place happens with uh, people between the ages of uh, 15 to 34. And, uh, but of course, there's a lot of violence that happens after that and a lot of violence that happens before that. So we, we have to uh, target more attention towards those other issues. And for within the African-American community, I think we tend to focus on violence that happens uh, to African-American men. And we don't talk about as much. We need to be able to talk about things that happen to us. But we also have to have conversations about things that happen uh, from us right. as well. Yeah. Rosa, what do you think um, in response to her question? I, I feel that um, this is really a black male issue. Um, yes, black women can participate you know, from the sidelines as far as I'm concerned. But this is a toxicity that is bred within black men and boys. This is something that, you know, they see among their peers and they listen to one another. Um, I want to bring up a book that I uh, will recommend to every woman who raises boys called The Male Brain. And it's a breakthrough and understanding of how men and boys think. It's by Dr. Luann Brizendeen, MD. She's a doctor, a doctor of psychiatry. She even tells women that at a certain point, as young as even three or four, little boys can become indignant. They do not listen to their mothers. They even start showing defiance. So if you're seeing this at such at, at that young age, men need to take the reins. They need to take the lead because it is a proven fact. Men listen to men. Boys listen to men. This is not something that I'm sorry, women have been taking the forefront and all of these social justice programs we've we've been on the front lines marching we've, we've been doing so much and it's to our own detriment because it's it's gotten worse so mm -hmm. my thing is black men who are not uh like the people that we're talking about these violent offenders and whatnot why aren't they taking a stance and taking a lead and saying, hey, this is not what black men are about. I'm a black man. I'm not like this and start, a, you know, and, and start addressing it that way. I just do not think that black women can effectively do anything with this violence issue 
that this is this should be a black led a black male led initiative you know like i said psych, uh, studies have shown that the that males listen to males i mean we we know this that is actually true unfortunately what they're listening to is a bunch of garbage you know that crazy site that i joined what was it called clubhouse I committed to being on there through the end of the year. I hope I make it. Every time I go on there, it's just so appalling to hear the conversations that the men have and the level of intellect is like knee high to a roach. And it's just it, the, the things that they choose to talk about and the plans that they have for, you know, for themselves and their children. It's just something is wrong. The black male culture is going down, is tanking. And you're right, unless we have more men who are willing to step into a leadership role, because it just seems like so many young men need a leader. I mean, they talk about that all the time. We don't have a leader. And, uh, but, you know, so they're kind of trying to just pitch around and join this manosphere and all this kind of stuff. And so they position themselves to have a leader. But the leader is like the Pied Piper of Hamlin, just leading them off the cliff. So they're not really making solid, sensible decisions about, you know, plotting out their life and using their time in their 20s wisely and selecting the right kind of woman, being sexually responsible, being financially responsible, you know, edu seeing about their education. I mean, the kind of things that a father, you know, or a, a, a mentor would guide them to do, it's not, it's not happening. So they're just lost. They're all really, like, by the thousands on these different media platforms, just really lost and confused. So, um... No, <laughs> I don't know if Dr. Williams be ready for the the nonsense on Clubhouse. <laughs> well, yeah, I, yeah, I kind of it would probably stay away from it. But uh, the the thing that I I think about is that there's a good program in Baltimore. Um, it's uh, a Center for uh, Workforce Development, and Joe Jones uh, is the executive director. And he's got a program with the House of Ruth. And the House of Ruth uh, deals with victims of uh, domestic violence and um, works with men who batter, but also works with battered women. And they have something called the Gateway Project. And what they, they do is that they have uh, the uh, batterers program, people from the batterers program, go over and talk to the fatherhood program about uh, domestic violence and ways that men can behave uh, <clears throat> not abusively towards their partner. But what they also have is a fatherhood program go over to the batters program to talk to them about fatherhood and mm -hmm. what is healthy fatherhood. And, uh, and that's what I was telling you when Johnny Rice year, years ago, uh, Dr. Johnny Rice ended up uh, uh, doing this uh, presentation with these uh, young men. Um, you know, about keeping it right and keeping it real. Uh, that's the program that he took it to. He took it to uh, Joe's program. And uh, there's a woman named Lisa Nitch that is at uh, the House of Ruth that uh, might be able to have a conversation because Johnny's left the organization. He's a professor now in uh, uh, one of the HBCUs in, in uh, Baltimore area. And, uh, but she can have, a, they're actually writing something for me about what do you say to men about fatherhood, but what do you also say to them about domestic violence? And so, oh, that would be good. I must, be, I think I need to reach out to her because that, yeah, I'm thinking, you know, I'm a writer and I'm thinking, okay, Rosa recommended a book, but most, you know, I don't know, young people don't really read books anymore, they're just, just not them, those books if you want to get information into the hands of the people who need it the most, it has to be quick, you know, like how they text. Everything is like they want instant gratification. They need it right now. So small bites of information delivered on social media, Facebook, TikTok, you know, uh, what else they use? Instagram, small bites of information that is a series, I think would be, would go a long way towards getting them to start reframing their behavior and how they view women and things. 
But right now, there's nothing like that. And when you do see it, it's negative. It's coming from, like they pointed out in the chat room, it's coming from those manosphere people. How to use women, how to pimp women, you know, uh, how to get over on women. I just, it's, that's what the, those are the messages. But I'm like, okay, that technique obviously works. Let's flip it around and use it for good instead of evil. But it would require you know, joining together of several of these organizations to target the younger people that are primarily on social media and then, you know, get the message out to them that way. That's that's my own thinking. What do you think, Rosa? I didn't hear her respond. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I, I do. I, I agree. You know, they're just you know the younger people they they are heavily into the internet so you have to kind of as they always say reach people where they are mm -hmm. you know you know my my recommendation for that book was uh primarily to uh single women who are raising sons you know so they they might get a better understanding of why they're getting so much pushback with their sons and why their sons are not listening but um uh, you know, outside of that, you know, I, it's it's not it's not going to take black women. We're not going to be able to get a handle on the uh, black manosphere. That's a yeah, very no, it's too many of them. Yeah, too it's, many it's of too them. many of them. It's too much negative messaging coming up out from that realm. I mean, you can't even get those channels blocked or deleted with the negative messaging that they're saying about black women. So. You know, at this point, black women are going to have to start deciding what is best for them. And black men, they're just, they're either going to crap or get off the pot. And, uh, you know, that that to me, that's where we are right now, especially with these murders. At this point, it's kill or be killed and do whatever you have to do to save yourself. These these numbers are horrific. I just yeah, it's I, really I, frightening. I, yeah, I have to keep pointing to the numbers. I have to keep saying it's every every six hours, really every five and a half hours. You know, right now, you have to save yourself. You have to you you have to do whatever you have can do to save yourself, protect yourself, and you know, use the information that's out there to your advantage. You know, don't even just listen to me. You know, don't don't just listen to me. See what's going on in your community. Look at what's going on globally. And you have to decide how you're going to navigate through this world based on actual real time information. Oh, Kiki, I want to bring you on, but you got to turn your camera off. The guest will just be on with, with um, audio. OK, now you're done. Let me add you. OK, what's your question, Kiki, or comment? Yes, um, I want to know why does it that your your amount of income affects how violent you are, as far as working in different schools and living in poor communities or, or working in uh, poor communities. I just noticed those uh, like teens and like young college students in high school, they're like much more violent than when I've been in like the middle class and, and uh in upper class areas why, why does your income have to do with how violent that you are i don't understand that oh that's a good one. okay what do you um have any insight on that oliver or rosa well i think uh poor communities are more overly policed and it, you uh the other thing too is the fact that uh some communities are more likely to call the police too so if you, even though we know that we have different reactions to uh, law enforcement, it doesn't mean that we don't make calls from uh, those communities to law enforcement to try to interrupt the violent behavior. What we want is we uh, oftentimes want uh, protection from uh, the uh, uh, behaviors that uh, uh, affect us, but it doesn't mean that we want any other types of harm to come from that. So, um, so I, I don't know that it answers your question, but I think poor communities are more overly policed than middle class and upper middle class uh, families. And oftentimes women may end up um, keeping things to themselves either because 
they don't want to appear to be disloyal to the abusive person or lose what it is that they they think that they have as a consequence of it. Uh, and so they're, they're, when you talk to middle class women and talk to poor women about their experiences, you know, there are different types of things that you'll hear from them describing their uh, uh, the situation and, and uh, what they experience and what they uh, don't want to uh, let other people know about. You know, uh, they want to try to keep it to themselves sometimes. I lived in a largely white part of the Bay Area for ooh, oh, about 16 years. And uh, what I saw was that the white guys tend to be masterful uh, mental and emotional and financial abusers. They were had high-powered jobs. They was not trying to put their hands on anybody. But they would break those women down until they were nothing with their words, with their threats and their attitudes they had behind them. The only reason I know that is because then I was working in the fitness field. They were my clients. And these chicks coming in draped in, you know, diamond tennis bracelets and all kind of just driving the latest drop top whatever, fifty, sixty thousand dollar cars. And but the 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 women, I mean, just the way their self esteem, the way they it was just terrible. And one of them's husband actually came into the gym and from across the room was berating me for her exercising because she was too sore to give him some, some, some. And he's saying this in full view of all these people and stuff, humiliating her, you know, in front of all these people. I was astonished because I had never seen anybody do any mess like that. But I tell you what I did. I told him, don't you ever talk to me like that. You're out your mind. You know, I mean, it's like one thing, you know, he's going to talk to his wife like that. But you you put my name in it now talking about what, you know, what I did. And so I told him off. I don't care who you are, who you think you are. And I'm not married to you. So I don't care. But um, just to see her crumble. And I saw that over and over. They don't put their hands on them. They're not doing that. But they would do still just mentally and emotionally break those women down into a mere shell of themselves so that they would steal the ultimate control that they were after. They still got it just with a different methodology. So Kiki, that's what I saw with my own two eyes. And I was going to agree. I agree with you, Deb. I believe that money uh, is for men because money is a power move for them. In poverty stricken areas, there is a lack of financial resources so because they can't exhort that financial abuse like men of means, and I know exactly what you're talking about uh, when you talk about financial abuse, they're a, the men with money and power abuse their women more psychologically. Not mm -hmm. saying that, they, that, that there isn't physical abuse in every socioeconomic level because there is, but you see more psychological abuse the higher up you go. Right. And the, uh, in poverty stricken areas, since men don't have access to money, the only other uh, way that they can exert their power is through physical means. So you will see more physical violence in poverty stricken areas. And yes, a lot of my cases do come from the inner city, you know, poverty stricken areas. And I do believe it's directly related to the lack of financial resources that those men don't have. And I still feel that those same men, if they weren't physically abusive, if given the opportunity to have access to money and means, they will be abusive on a different type of spectrum. Here's a question um, that I think is a good one to, to show. She, I think she meant like the men with the money. Are they killing their women at the same rate? No, that black no, women are getting killed. No, and I'm gonna I'm gonna answer that question because uh, other people continuously try to come at me with this. Again, don't just go by my statistics. The FBI, the FBI says a black woman is has been murdered every six hours in the black community. So when people try to come at me with this proximity issue that uh, domestic violence is a crime of proximity. Yes, we know that. Of course, it's a crime of proximity, but we're talking about the rates 
of homicide as it relates to women that are occurring. You do not see the white community, those numbers are not every six hours. This is a health crisis, people, and people want to keep, you know, trying to, you know, play this, play this game. And that's really what it is. And this is my folks that I'm talking to. I'm not concerned with other communities because I allow other communities to deal with the issues that they, how they see fit. But I'm talking about my people. You all are so obtuse and you want to sit up and try and deflect and try to make it seem like, oh, it's a numbers game. They're playing these games with us. They want to make it seem like we're more violent. Well, the reality is, to some extent, we are being very violent towards each other. We are being violent towards each other. We are not seeing these numbers in other communities outside, say, the Native American um, community. But we have an issue in our community. And by deflecting and asking, well, is Sally Sue getting uh, murdered at the same rate? Are, are, are rich men doing the same thing? Stop concerning yourself with what other folks are doing and focus on what's going on in your community. Other folks ain't coming to save us. They're not coming to save us. So you need to focus on what's going on in the community and how either you can deal with the issue if you want to be a part of the community and help stamp this problem out or save yourself. That's the only way. There's only two ways to do it. Either you're going to be a part of the solution or you're going to be every man for himself and you're going to be focused on your behind. That's the only thing at this point we can do. That's well, it, I want to, you know, let you all both have um, time to, you know, sum up your thoughts on this topic and um, let everyone know where they can find you. I have also put links to their websites in the show description already, young uh, listeners, but I do want them to you know, be able to sum up their thoughts uh, for you uh, before we close out the show. So, Oliver, what would you like to say in closing? Uh, I guess for me, it's a way to be able to get a, a community to respond. I think I would talk to the NAACPs and the urban leagues and uh, uh, within your community to try to get it on their radar screen. But I think I'd also have a conversation with churches and, and mosques to have conversations with them about the, the challenge of, uh, of addressing um, intimate partner violence. Uh, within their uh, community. So, you know, it's not just the imam, it's the, uh, it's the, uh, uh, the mosque board that you have to talk to. It's not just the minister, but it's also the, the, the deacon's board you have to talk to, and then the sisters within the church. You know, what Bishop Mitchell has shown is the fact that you have to teach people how to, to listen uh, to victims of abuse, to be able to be able to hear what they have to say, and and then to, you got to develop pathways to be able to uh, uh, help them to uh, um, recover or to, to find help, which means that you have to collaborate with other organizations like shelter programs or batters programs within uh, the community too. And ministers uh, have to understand that sometimes you can't be a character witness for a person that's uh, abusive. You know, the, it's it's not something where they're just dealing with the problem. It's a crime. Right. And they have to find ways to be able to reconcile that. So that's in that, that uh, some of those conversations are in the, the workbook that's in the uh, – uh, speaking of faith, that's uh, uh, the book that we uh, wrote. It was uh, uh, three ministers and myself, that, and I'm not a minister, but that uh, wrote it. But each one of us do work, have done work around the issue of domestic violence. And I think those videos uh, that are on the website are something that could be helpful to. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Williams, for donating your time to this this very, very important topic. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. And in conclusion for me, I want to say that uh, for Black women, my thing right now, I'm about political mobilization. As Black women, we need to start getting politically mobilized to make sure that our interests 
are being served just like the issues in other communities. And we need to start uh, being politically motivated. If politicians do not want to address what's going on in our community and how we are dying, then we need to start using the power of the vote as we did in this last election to start serving our own interests and let these politicians know that we're just gonna remove our votes from you and they'll go to whomever will serve our needs. I have no political affiliation. I have no, you know, I'm not loyal to anyone but the black woman and girl. So we need to start mobilizing politically to say, this is what's going on in our community. This is what's going on with black women and girls and it needs to be addressed. And if not, you need to start filling out uh, unemployment papers. <laughs> yeah, because you, you out of a job, home skillet. Well, thank you, Rosa. You just was just beautiful. I'm just really happy that uh, that you stepped up and that, and that my, like I said, my, my wonderful surprise that I've known, I just knew you, but I just didn't know that this was you. Yep. <laughs> All right, let me... Um, get to the point where I want to close out the show. I hope that you guys enjoyed that and learned something. Um, like I said, if you wanted to reach out to either of them, their contact information can be found in the show description down below. And, uh, you know, you know, feel free to go over to their websites, you know, drop them a line on the contact form or, you know, read the things that, uh, that Dr. Williams uh, was talking about and check out all the updated stats on uh, Black Femicide U.S. Um, I also want to uh, let you know what's coming up. Let's see what we got. Okay, so the next thing, the next show is What the Fuck Tuesday. Okay, but then on, uh, oh, that's right. I'm going to do this show. Now, this is going to be an upload. Okay, it's going to be an upload. So this will not be a live show. It's going to be a little bit lighter than what we did today. But there's three, in my mind, there are three types of single women. Because, you know, people always ask the question, well, why are you single? In my mind, there's three reasons. Well, three groupings of reasons. So I'm going to make a video and up, try to upload that this week. Um, I'm also set up another live advice show where um, you can, you'll be typing your questions in or you can use this platform and call in and get your question answered right on the air in real time just right as it happens that'll be taking place on friday december 3rd at 6 p.m so you can use either the, the cash app uh thing there dexterism or you can super chat on youtube and uh and what else do i have something i thought i had something else that i was doing too but anyway whatever i can't remember but uh that's what we got going on on the show on the on the uh, platform coming up also just remind you before you go please like the video share a link it doesn't have to be this one it can be any show and then subscribe and hit that instant notification bell as well we appreciate all new subscribers to the channel and uh you know all your participation and all of your support and encouragement thanks to everyone who sent links for the stories that I was able to feature on this broadcast and put those slides together and stuff. But there were so many of them, I just like, I tired. I, just, I could, I did what, 10, 12, or whatever that was. And then that was it. I said, okay, that's enough of this. I think they get the general idea. And I felt like Rosa would, you know, uh, flesh out the rest of it. But uh, I want to thank you one more time. Thank all my, you know, my two guests that were just very, very wonderful to donate their time for us. I appreciate all of you. And I uh, want to remind you to check out their sites and also go through any of the almost, it's almost a thousand videos on this channel now. If you have any questions about your dating life or relationship, self-esteem, setting boundaries, we got all of that kind of stuff available for you. Just type in your keywords in search and then a video with those keywords or titles will pop up. Thank you very much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your weekend.